we are live. Okay, it is September the 8th and uh, welcome back to school everybody. Welcome back to work. Uh, and here we are the uh, Corporate and Community Services Standing Committee of the Town of Collingwood. I'm gonna call this meeting to order and we will uh, acknowledge and that this event has taken place on the traditional territory of the indigenous, indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, including the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Ojibwe peoples, and on lands connected with the Lake Simcoe Nottawasaga Treaty of 1818. This is the home of a diverse range of Indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors to our society. And we would like to adopt the agenda. And I have moved by Vice Chair Comey and seconded by Mayor Saunderson, the content of the Corporate and Community Services Standing Committee agenda for September the 8th be adopted as presented. And uh, I will call the vote on that. Whoops, and I vote on that too. Okay, and that is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving on in our uh, business, do we have any business arising from the previous meeting? Seeing none, we'll move on to de declarations of pecuniary interest. Do we have any declarations of pecuniary interest at this time? Now I'll remind members of the committee that uh, should that happen, please say so as soon as it comes to you. We now have deputations and we are ha I'm happy to welcome Jeff Young and Carrington Lausen and Shannon McCready, or McCready, I'm sorry, and uh, Jessica Lair, who are with B City Canada or Pollinate Collingwood, and they're hoping that we will become a B City. And um, Clerk Almas, do we let them in now? Is that how that works? Correct. We're just allowing them to join now. There's Jessica. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. And I see Shannon. Hello. Welcome. Jeff, welcome. And I think we're waiting for one more. Carrington may not join us. I'm, okay. Yeah, it might be just the three of us. All right. Well, uh, I believe you have 10 minutes. Take it away. Excellent. Perfect. Excellent. I am Jessica with Pollinate Collingwood, and we're here today to talk to you about B City Canada and the town of Collingwood, hopefully attaining that certification. And in fact, we're asking the council to support an application for that. Next slide, please. So here we are, we are Pollinate Collingwood, and we came into existence this past February. And we've had great successes this past year. We've put in 15 community native pollinator gardens under the David Suzuki Foundation Butterfly Ways Community Gardens. And now to be part of that, it has to be volunteer led, which we all are. In addition to that, we were offered the pilot program for bringing it to schools this fall. So we have nine committed. And with that, as a pilot program, we get to have the plants donated from the David Suzuki Foundation, which is fantastic in itself. We've had a successful native plant sale this past year in which we sell, sold all the plants that we had. The money is now going to educational projects as well as additional gardens next year. We've created educational, or we've created and distributed educational outreach materials, including information sheets, signs, and activities, including through Camp Collingwood. We've linked interested people and parties in town, including residences, businesses, organizations, and the town itself. We have, have, we have had success with digital media. We have over 150 followers on Facebook, as well as a Twitter account and Instagram account. And we've also been in traditional media with a couple of newspaper articles. Next slide, please. So what is Bee City Canada? Bee City Canada is an organization that connects people, pollinators, and places. It started in the United States in 2011, and Shelley Candle started Bee City Canada in 2016. She was really keen and saw the benefits of the program and brought it forth to us. There are now over 100 other bee cities in Canada, including Aurelia, Barrie, and the Township of Georgian Bay, which is by Honey Harbor as well as campuses and schools. In 2018, the United States program merged and became an official program under Xerces Society, which is a big deal because this connects international uh, groups and is not for, for profit and wonderfully, it is science-based, which is very important. Now we're gonna to switch to Shannon and she's gonna tell us a little bit about some of our native species. Hi, thank you. 
Across Ontario, many local communities are part of Bee City Canada. Next slide. These community oh sorry, next slide. <laughs> These communities help to support many native insects, including 12 pollinators on Ontario species at risk list. Pollinators, Canadian poll pollinators include bees, wasps, flies, beetles, butterflies, moths, and birds. There are 855 species of native bees in Canada, in addition to the domesticated honeybee, which are not native. When we take a look at the species at risk list for native plants, next slide, please. The number greatly increases. Pollinators and native plants have an inherent relationship that is mutually beneficial. Caterpillars rely on specific native host plants and can only survive if they can feed on them. Three species of butterflies have been lost in Ontario due to the unavailability of wild lupin. We now face the same challenge of providing enough milkweed that monarch butterflies don't meet the same fate. All native flowers, species at risk or not, provide the best and most accessible food for pollinators and pollinators aid the reproduction of many native flowers. These plants in turn create food and shelter for birds and other animals up the food chain. Next slide. Beyond the species that we have just touched upon, there is a loss of biodiversity around the world. Every year we see a growing number of articles warning us that pollinators need our help and we need theirs as well. Here are headlines of a few articles from the past two years that address the importance of native pollinators. We can support pollinators by recovering habitat, increasing the use of native plants, reducing or eliminating pesticide use, leaving leaf litter through the winter, and leaving early spring dandelions. Next slide, please. On October 16th, 2019, the Collingwood Council officially declared the climate crisis. The planting of native pollinator species and education around them directly correlates to supporting efforts to mitigate climate change. Their presence in town supports the natural heritage systems, supports urban wildlife, helps to create wildlife corridors, and assists with sustainable development measures. Budget reports, the official plan discussion papers, town surveys, and the town's urban forest master plan all include reference to biodiversity supported by native pollinators. As an aside, 94% of survey respondents gave four or five stars to restoration and the protection of natural habitats. And next slide, please. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff. Thanks, Shannon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you ask, how does planting native pollinator plants directly link to the town of Collingwood? Um, native plants are considered to be cost-effective beautification while supporting biodiversity, so it's a win-win. Um, the plants, while being cost-effective, also provide educational value and are an important source of food and shelter for our pollinators. These plants require little watering. They are naturally resistant to pests and disease and are perfectly adapted to our local soil and climate. Native pollinator plants also create low-impact development for environmental management. Adding native plants enha enhances environmental sustainability and are easy to create and maintain within the town. Bioswales, rain gardens, and the use of natural areas beside pavement are some great examples. Pollinators also support healthy ecosystems that clean the air, increase carbon sequestration, stabilize soils, and help from the severe weather. Um, additional benefit is that these green spaces help to lower the urban heat island effect as stated as a goal in the official plan discussion papers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, native pollinator gardens also support ecotourism and mental health. They create an eco-friendly brand image for the town, which the town already has, so continue there. Um, and there are also great events across the country that involve identifying, recording, reporting, and even tagging butterflies. In 2011, the City of Toronto released a document named Butterflies of, Tr of Toronto and encouraged people to participate in the joy of butterfly watching by hunting for host plants and visiting their top 10 exceptional butterfly viewing locations. Um, there's also an app called iNaturalist where you can take pictures on your cell phone and um, any insect or bug you see um, or plant, um, it will give you an ID. So it's, um, it's a very good learning tool. Um, brain prescriptions or ecotherapy are also prescribed um, for general well-being and mental health and have become more popular than the last few years. 
Benefits of being active in nature um, include reducing stress, anxiety, and depression. In Collingwood, there are already several groups that provide opportunities to get active in nature. Um, it can be in, on a trail, in a forest, or even just in your garden, um, watching the birds. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, well, looking beyond the town boundaries, uh, pollinators also support um, the agricultural industry. Native bees are the major pollinators in North America and around the world. Um, pollinator partnership states between 75 to 95 of all flowering plants on earth need help with pollination, and one out of every three bites of your food um, is there because of pollination. Together, the plants and their pollinators are indispensable to natural resource, and last year, all pollinators added $217 billion to the global economy. Um, so what Bee City Canada will do for Collingwood, um, it will publicize the town's designation through their national website, social media, and other media channels. Um, we'll also be able to use their logo for promotional uh, material and signage. Um, they'll have educational webinars for anyone who's interested who wants to learn more about it. Um, there'll also be a welcome package with an official declaration recognizing our town as a Bee City. Um, you can also reach out to other Bee Cities across Ontario and collaborate with them while also creating uh, wildlife corridors to help encourage um, native pollinator insects uh, around the country. Um, next slide, and I'll give it back to Jess to wrap things up. We're gonna need you to unmute, Jessica. Thank and you. Just for that, I'm gonna give you an extra 10 seconds. Oh, perfect, thank you. Okay, and we're actually past this slide. There we go, excellent, thank you so much. So let's look at the requirements for becoming a B City Canada member. There is an annual application. In that application, you identify any current initiatives taking place in your community. These commitments and actions would address creating biodiversity in pollinator habitats, educating the public about the importance of pollinators, a yearly commitment to celebrate National Pollinator Week, which is the third week of June, a discussion of the city's long-term pollinator strategy, and a brief explanation of what it means to our town to become a bee city. As said, there is an annual fee. It's of $200. It's waived the first year, and that goes to educational materials as well as communities that may not have the funds to put in place a pollinator strategy or gardens. So it actually goes forward to something. And finally, a resolution from the town to accept the designation. Next slide, please. So next steps. We are asking for council to support the creation of a working committee or group with the goal to submit an application for 2021. Things to consider, the annual, uh, sorry, the annual application of $200 after the first year, commitment from the council and town to complete an application for becoming a B-City Canada um, community. With that, um, it would require the establishment of a working group and that is basically because, again, it's through the town, we actually have to have that sign off along the way. But it would also include the involvement, for example, of somebody from that Parks and Rec program, as well as non-governmental organizations, for example, Blue Mountain Water, Watershed Trust, as well as interest groups, for example, the Nature League. And this is just to help form the direction of the program. For 2021, it could mean a possibility of three meetings. One, to prepare the application, which is something that we would do, but also involve other members. The preparation of a National Pollinator Week event, for example, an education evening with public um, seminars. And then finally, a meeting that would involve a follow-up or any other um, requirements for the year. So we'd be happy to take any questions that you have at this point. Thank you so much. And your timing was almost perfect. Well done. Uh, so at this point we turn, I believe, um, and Clerk Elmas can correct me if I'm incorrect, but we turn to uh, members of the public who may be joining us in our webinar format if they have any questions for uh, you folks uh, before, I, uh, before I bring it to the committee. So um, Clerk Elmas, has anyone uh, who's watching had indicated that they were interested in, in asking any questions on this issue? No, it does not appear that there is interest at this point, uh, Chair McLeod. And so I turn it over to the committee. Uh, do we have any, uh, oh, Councillor Berman. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, just a great presentation. And if it's appropriate now, I'll, uh, I'll move that the uh, request be uh, referred to staff. 
And I think that is exactly what we will have to do because there's a financial component to it. Uh, and Clerk Almas, you can correct me again if I'm wrong, but I believe that we would have to ask for our staff recommendation regarding this. Uh, because of the financial component. Um, and okay, great. I see you're nodding. Uh, so, um, and I imagine that uh, Clerk Almas, you can massage the wording or whatever needs to happen. Uh, and so, uh, Councillor Berman, do you have a seconder for your motion, do you think? I do now. You do have a seconder for your motion. And so, uh, the motion is to ask for a staff report to come back. I'm going to assume we can do this within the, before the next meeting. Clerk Almas. Right, through, the, uh, through yourself as the chair to the committee, um, I, I think that it would probably be doable by the next standing committee meeting. Um, right. We'll just have to uh, check with PRC staff and, and look at their capacity at this point, but that would be the anticipation. Correct. So we have the motion on the floor and we have a seconder. Do we have anyone else who wants to speak either to the motion or to the group? Ah, uh, Vice Chair Comey. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Chair. Um, through you to the committee, I just want to say I thought that was a really great presentation. Like I made a bunch of notes, I learned a lot, but something really piqued my interest and I just, for my own curiosity, and uh, through you, Chair, I think, Jessica, you mentioned it. There's a component where you're working with our local schools and I, it, I wasn't sure is that through both Paul Nate Collingwood and potentially the B-City or maybe a, if you wouldn't mind just enlightening us a little more on that. Jessica? Mm -hmm. Certainly, happy to. So yes, the school project was offered as a uh, project through David Suzuki Foundation, um, through Paul and Nate Collingwood, and that goes into the school's B-City. Um, any educational material could also head that way. In terms of the sale that we did, we have committed $110 is the for a group of us um, for a pollinator partnership education kit, which would also be accessible to the schools. So right now, nine schools, we have a possibility of up to 12 for this planting this fall. The plants would arrive this upcoming week and there's a window of about two weeks. And so far the feedback's been great from local schools. The kids are excited to get out and have this education opportunity. The nice thing about all of these plants is they're divisible for the most part over the next couple of years. And so the gardens will expand whether they choose to go across the schoolyard further and the 15 gardens that we planted, they can disperse around the businesses and the community as well. So the whole idea is just to keep it going. Mr. Comey? That's awesome. Thanks. I think that's absolutely a wonderful way to integrate a program, you know, throughout the community. So thank you and your uh, organization again. That was a really great presentation. Mayor Saunderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I know there's three of you here today. I'm wondering uh, how many in your group and when you established yourselves. There are four of us, great question. Um, I started discussions way back with the head of Parks, Recreation, Culture back in November, um, just trying to see what the feel was, support within the community as well, talking to our local organizations, Nature League, Horticultural Society, uh, Environment Network, and so on and so forth. Uh, people seem very keen and came across the David Suzuki Foundation. Their big goal is 12 measurable gardens, which was a great place that I thought to start. People are familiar with David Suzuki Foundation, its name, again, these 12 gardens. Uh, if you explore around the community, you'll find that there's everything from little two foot by two foot gardens to three foot by eight gardens. And it's a way to show people that they can just do this in their backyard. It's about adding native plants where you can, not taking apart gardens per se, because even non-natives do provide pollination services. But as Shannon touched upon, it's the ability for hosting the larvae, the caterpillars for our local e ecosystems, which is really important. Um, Jeff connected through the trail um, working group and then Shannon connected through the library. The library was fantastic and did a post about pollinate Collingwood on their social media page and she connected with us and we were able to get one community meeting together right before COVID was called. That was that Wednesday night. Um, we had about 17 or 18 people there and Carrington was there and she was somebody else who had been suggested to contact with. So ourselves, there's four of us is sort of the leads and um, in town, there's about 10 businesses that we have had great contact with. In fact, some of them have created their own um, working groups, Red Scarf Equestrian and the Wild Stand. They've sort of evolved and done some other things. 
but um, it sort of exploded from there. It's gone even beyond, I think, all of our expectations. And to have this honor to take it into the schools, which will then help to bring it to residents, I mean, it's as I said, exceeded all of our expectations. The nice thing about Jeff, Shannon, Carrington, and I is we each have different strengths that we bring to the table too. So it's been a joy to work with everybody. Well, congratulations to all of you. Thank you for your initiative and you're gonna create quite a buzz around town, it would seem, so thank you. Just couldn't help himself there. Couldn't help myself. With the dad jokes. Uh, and uh, I believe that's all the questions from the committee, is it? Is that it all of you? Uh, I have one. Is it is it you folks that's put up the little the little garden um, right near Pretty River on the on the train trail? Is that you? Correct. That's one that Jeff put in um, through the Trails Committee also clearing. That was something sort of his initiative along that way. There's also one over by the Hamilton um, drain just past the crossing on here, Ontario. You can find them at Agnora. There's two there, Collingwood Brewery, the Learning Garden, the Community Garden at Heritage Park, which is an amazing one because it just that garden is incredible with all the community partnerships involved in all of it. Um, where else do we have? Red Scarf Equestrian, the Wild Stand. Um, Jeff and Shannon, am I missing anyone? <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're about 15. The one down by Watts Boathouse, um, which yeah. is lovely and is cared for by the Paddle Club. So yeah, it just, again, exceeded in a community all expectations. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much for answering our questions and for your presentation tonight. And I'll call the question of the committee uh, on, the, uh, on the motion that is before us. Great, that passes unanimously and we'll receive a staff report at our next uh, committee meeting. Thank you so much for being with us, Thank Jessica, you. Shannon, and, uh, and Jeff. Thank you, uh, next, Thank you. Thanks. Next up on our agenda is, let me just reopen my screen. I love it when they go to sleep when you're busy. Uh, here we are, uh, Collingwood Harbor Charter Air Service. And uh, we are expecting a presentation at this time from Dustin Foreman. And I think the clerk or uh, clerk services will be letting Dustin into the meeting now and we will welcome him. And I believe he has a PowerPoint presentation for us that has been um, forwarded to us in advance, uh, but we're gonna see that as well. Let's just wait for him. Hello, yeah, Dustin. I am here. Hi. I am here. I, I was watching the whole thing from here. <laughs> Great, uh, take it away, you have 10 minutes. Okay, well, first time Zoom call here, so uh, don't expect any miracles. That was a great presentation, but uh, yeah, I, I submitted to you guys a form of the business plan. Um, there's probably quite a bit of information there. There's a lot of details. Those are all taken care of. I just wanted you guys to see them in case you needed to uh, be reassured of those. I just wanna focus on maybe uh, just the big picture and just kind of, uh, uh, just kind of fill you guys in on what I had in mind, the vision, and um, um, there's a there's just two specific things that I'd be asking, and uh, I hope to you know more than anything else just to get you guys to share the vision and um, um, get you on board. Um, so, yeah, I can just kind of dive right into it here, and then you answer any questions you guys have. Um, so, yeah, specifically. Um, well, the name is Slate Blue Airways, and that's to kind of capture the many different shades of blue that that are on the bay. Um, yeah, the um, what we're asking for is uh, the permission to operate out of the harbor. Um, so it's going to be a, like a float plane charter service. And this is something that I've got a lot of experience doing all over the world. This is the area that I'm from. I grew up a professional skier and Collingwood is not quite home, but pretty close to home. Um, the other pilot that's on board is currently over in Dubai, and he's someone that I've actually um, shared a the similar career path up north in northern Ontario and British Columbia. He was in Australia. I was over in Vietnam. Um, so he's actually from Alora, so he's interested in coming home too. So we're both pretty invested in the area, and we want to kind of showcase what Collingwood has, and particularly um, what Georgian Bay has. And so we're kind of asking for... Um, uh, a dock space to do passenger transfers. Now the aircraft probably wouldn't be kept there overnight or uh, anything permanent. It would just be uh, probably three to four days a week to come and go. Um, so I've been down and checking out the area and determining its like suitability and everything else. And there's there's uh, there's actually three 
the four areas that could work. Um, so I can get into those when I discuss the base. But um, yeah, so the vision is to uh, bring the boots on the boots on the ground float plane charter service to the Collingwood waterfront, adding value and aviation culture to the area while making it a part of Collingwood's uh, future development going forward. And the service will be designed to honor the unique Collingwood and George Bay area and Canadian bush flying culture as a whole. It, some of its nostalgia and that some of the aviators that I've met um, that helped to shape the industry. So um, the market is uh, kind of threefold. Um, so local tourism, I've, as everybody knows, there's quite a bit of uh, weekend traffic and calling with these days, uh, city traffic, people coming up here for the weekend or the day and looking for things to do. Um, of course, in the winter, there's the mountains and the ski hill, which grabs pretty much everybody. But uh, in the summer, um, I think that, you know, some more variety and um, offering some scenic tours, um, you know, two to three days a week, again, out of the harbor, showcasing the area and uh, some of the, the, the closer islands and the escarpment. So uh, for those tourists, that would be um, one area of the market. Um, I've talked to a lot of people that have uh, second homes and properties, uh, maybe up in Point of Barrel and San Susi, Perry Sound, Georgia Bay, Muskoka's. And so for some of them, they need to get in and out quickly um, or more efficiently, it would be to service them. Dustin, and then, I don't uh, to interrupt you, I apologize. Yeah. Do you want us to be forwarding your presentation? We're on the first page here and I'm wondering whether we ought to be moving <laughs> through it for you. Yeah. Um, no, I'm still kind of just talking about the market. Okay, sorry, just um, wanted to be sure. <laughs> yeah, um, that's okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, most of the, everything is is pretty well there for you to see, um, but basically just service, you know, kind of the, the first time visitors to Collingwood, as well as people that live here um, and businesses, realtors that may want to show some of the islands and then charter service to, um, um, you know, to uh, private destinations and some of the Muskokas. And, and um, in the long term, um, I've been up to Tobermory to, to check that area out and spoke to some business owners up there. And in the long term, I'd actually like to get uh, maybe like a daily trip out of Collingwood up to Tobermory and then um, have a second airplane based up there to do some, some tours in Tobermory. Because that area, I'm not sure if any of you have been, but it's... Uh, it's bustling and the drive from Collingwood to Tobermory is, you know, it's kind of lengthy and a flight. You could be there in about 25 minutes and it's beautiful up that coastline. So, um, you know, there's, uh, yeah, that's, that's something that's on the radar uh, in the long term as well. But for now, the focus is just to, just to kind of um, be able to come and go from, from Collingwood Harbor and have a place to transfer passengers from and, and um, uh, build from that. So you can go to the next slide. So the base, um, yeah, there's there's four areas that I had in mind, and I would take your guys' direction on what um, what would be best for the the you know the town and the, the other businesses and and public that's operating there. Um, the one uh, was that new Birch Street dock that got put in. Um, it's actually a kayak launch, and there's a boat launch there too, but it's a soft rubber floating dock, perfect for a seaplane. Um, again. Uh, you know, there's good tie downs and it's not a place that the seaplane would be would be hanging out all day. This is a small airplane. We're, we're talking about like a six seat uh, Cessna 185. So very, very quiet, um, not very intrusive. And so that dock would work really well. Um, the other one that would work is the government dock. So this a space in front of the, the Huronic. If there was just a 30, 40 foot section that was maybe painted red along the rail. Uh, just to indicate that that's a seaplane dock. That's something that happens out west where it's the part of the culture. Um, you know, seaplane spots on government docks are, is pretty common and they just generally mark it off with some bumpers and a red uh, a red painting on the, on the rail, which indicates that it's, you know, for seaplanes only. So that was the other one. Um, the other one is the, um, you know, over by the Collingwood Marina at, at the end of one of those fingers would be just fine. And then uh, the fourth option, I've got a couple of phone calls into like the Cranberry Yacht Club to see if there's space over there. So that would be kind of 
um, going more the private the private route. And um, that's something they're they're really really busy as well. So space is a premium, and they I'm waiting for a call back from um, the actual uh, I guess it would be the the marina owner or manager. Um, so that that's the other option. And um, yeah, the pilots. There's myself as I mentioned, and then the other pilot is Tim Ketcher. Um, so both very high time experienced pilots that have operated, you know, seaplanes safely, zero incidents all around the uh, the country and the world. And we've got resumes to show and references and anything like that, if that was of interest. Um, insurance, that's, these are other boxes that will be um, kind of internal stuff. I just wanted you guys to be aware that, we're, that it's all being thought about. Um, yeah, the customers I talked a little bit about uh so the just the the general public and you know people with vacation properties and then business owners like realtors and people that need to get to toronto um property owners people with with cottages maybe in places that are a little bit far off and difficult to drive to those are the customers competition um that's the beauty of it this is the first i think the first thing in it of its kind for for collingwood the area really, really lends itself to it. You know, it's kind of funny. The pandemic brought me brought me home and um, kind of put the whole industry on ice. And so it sort of created this opportunity in some ways because I was down there looking at, at it all. And I had always thought Collingwood was a big, rough lee shore that gets, you know, heavy swell and no place for a seaplane. But when I saw the harbor and some of the protection it has and the grain elevators out there, I just instantly thought that, you know, for the image of Collingwood uh, and having um, the backdrop of the, the escarpment there with the ski hills in the backdrop and, um, you know, being able to get to some of the islands, which I know how, how beautiful those are in the area. I just uh, thought it would be, you know, something that's really, really good. And um, so the, um, yeah, there is no competition locally. I think there is a helicopter maybe out of the airport that does tours. Um, but uh, I've seen them just a few times in the summer, but it's not the same as, as being able to climb onto a seaplane on the water. It's a part of Canadian culture, like a very big part of Canadian culture. And, and um, I just think it's, it's very Canadian and a very, a very different experience. And uh, you know, when you, yeah, I've got some photos which hopefully will, will capture that, what I'm talking about for you guys. Um, pricing has been discussed and Oh, about the competition. Yeah, there is there is comparable things in Perry Sound, which is obviously doesn't have the um the you know the what Collingwood has going on with just the amount of development and uh um money that's coming into the town and tourism. Um and it works in Perry Sound. So I thought that you know that's a pretty good indicator that it would that it would probably work even better here. I did operate, I flew for one summer when uh, several years ago, I, I came home and flew um, at a Toronto Island uh, for a company uh, that runs charters into Muskoka's. So they, but that's a, that's a separate uh, uh, thing. So those are the two competitors in the area, but again, there's nothing in Collingwood. So it's, it's very much. Um, Justin, I'm gonna hold you there because your 10 minutes has expired. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a couple of thoughts you wanted to, to give us quickly? You know, yeah, I should have had a timer going. I'm sorry. Really, if I could just skim through the photos quickly, that's mm -hmm. it. So there's the harbor, um, safe areas for takeoff and landing. And there's one of the seaplane docks I was, I was canvassing for. Um, and there's an aerial shot of the harbor, or some of the escarpment. Yeah. Of course, these are just local attractions. That's Henry's Rest Fish Restaurant and some places up on Georgian Bay. Um, these are places I've flown into Georgian Bay. I think Lake Abay is the other one. Go Home Bay up in San Susi. All places that as seen from above. Now, this is a similar service in Tofino where I, where I flew. And Tim actually flew there as well after me. Um, so that's the same airplane that I'm, that I'm speaking of, a Cessna 180 float plane. And you can see like the visuals from above are Incredible. You can just go ahead. There's only two more slides. Northern Ontario. Um, 
that's where I started my career on a, again, similar type of airplane. That's it. Thank you so much. Sorry, guys, that was my first presentation, but uh, you I'm did sure you'll have really questions. Go ahead. <laughs> that was, thank you very much for that. Um, and so um, as we do in a committee with uh, deputations, I'll ask if there's any uh, of our uh, members of the public who've joined us in the webinar form, if uh, there are any questions from, from them, and I'll look to the clerk to advise me on that. Certainly, we do have a few attendees, Chair McLeod. Um, if anybody is interested in speaking to the matter, they can either uh, raise their hand or enter in the chat feature that you would wish to speak. And no one is interested at this point. Then I will uh, move to our members of the committee if they have any uh, questions that they would like to ask uh, Mr. Foreman about his proposal. Members of the committee. All right, then uh, I have a couple of questions. I know that's a surprise. Um, can we ask uh, just a couple of things I wanted to ask about your plane in particular? And, and, and I'm thinking um, at this point that what we're looking at is maybe something similar to what we're, or what you're asking for, I suppose, is um, something similar to what the um, Huronic does at our harbor, which is that there's a spot, we have a, we have a contract with that, um, with that operator and, and there's an exchange and there's a percentage and, and so on and so forth. Is that, what you're, is that what you're thinking of Mr. Foreman with regard to this uh, presentation? Yeah, exactly. Um, they, that was kind of the, the, like a similar model uh, that they have with the kiosk even down there for, you know, for greeting people, uh, customers and passengers. And then, um, yeah, whatever kind of arrangement they have, we would kind of maybe um, ask for something similar in terms of, you know, you, a percentage of either a, a, a takeoff and landing fee or a percentage of uh, uh, usage or revenue to use that space. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and just out of, on a, from a ballpark point of view, I have some friends who live down near Porter and if you were to bring them from Porter to Collingwood, rather than them having to take the 400, what would that cost them, do you suppose, under this model uh -huh. proposing? Porter as in like, uh, port, did you say airport. Porter? Yeah, the Island Airport in Toronto. Oh, yeah, exactly. Sorry, well, where Porter flies out of, sorry. Porter flies out of, yeah. Um, exactly, well, that's, you know, that's a great destination. You know, the big thing is it allows people to extend their weekend by, um, a, a couple days too because of the time saving and the traffic saving right um i'd have to get back to you on the mileage what's do you know what the mileage is it's again i think the numbers are there generally industry rate is about eight to nine dollars a mile for the cessna so you could you could really work it out just based on uh, kind of a straight shot as the crow flies you could calculate the the cost for there it gets expensive it's a single person but if you're talking three to four people that are all involved it's actually um, you know, probably pretty affordable. Wonderful. All right. Thank you very much. And if there are no other questions from the committee, we will thank, uh, we will thank you for your time and, uh, and for your, uh, for your energy. Yeah. Thanks guys. Thanks for hearing. And, um, again, this is just kind of the introduction in phase one, and I look forward to speaking with you guys, uh, hopefully further and, um, addressing any concerns uh, that you have or anything like that. Great. Thank you. All right, thank you. That brings us to staff reports. And uh, oh, Clerk Almas, I can see you have something to say. Um, I didn't know if you would like to address this matter now, if there's any, uh, if, if the committee is interested in referring this to staff uh, for a report. Is there any interest in that from this committee? Vice Chair Comey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think that's reasonable for staff to have a look at. I don't, speaking for myself, I mean, all I can think of is we have a multitude of users down at the harbor, uh, obviously paddlers and swimmers and recreational boaters. So uh, I wouldn't have the expertise to know, you know, a good harbor management plan, but I'm not opposed to the idea of staff having a further look into this. It, you know, it might spark some interest in tourism as we've been talking about and drawing more people down to our waterways. So. I, I'm not opposed to uh, putting the motion for that we let staff have a discussion 
uh, and a look into this further to see if it's feasible. Do we have a seconder for that motion to have a, to request a staff report on this, uh, on this issue? It appears we do not. Okay. Then we will move on to uh, item six in our agenda, uh, which is the public notice policy. And uh, I will ask Clerk Almas to present on that. Certainly, thank you, Chair McLeod. So we have just a very brief presentation that I'll take you through. as we get it queued up here. All right. So this is a refresh um, to our notice bylaw that we previously had in place. So if we go to the first slide. So what is public notice? So formal notice to the public of matters of municipal interest often required by statute as opposed to more informal information that's shared by the town. It is a requirement to have a notice policy uh, in accordance with section 270 of the Municipal Act, and it is part of the town's overall commitment to accountability and transparency. Next slide. Why is an update needed? So our current notice bylaw was uh, enacted by council in 2003, and it makes reference to many aspects of the acts that are no longer in force or have been amended. As long as this bylaw remains in effect, we must adhere to um, the provisions within the bylaw. And in many instances, there is unnecessary repetition of notice requirements from other pieces of legislation. And some examples of those are the Municipal Act, Heritage Act, and Planning Act. So again, one of the items that we wanted to uh, make sure that was removed, um, and again, the notice po policy was actually vetted uh, by our municipal solicitor as well, is any areas where there is duplication or they are prescriptive in the statute regarding timeframes, we remove those from the policy because it's already uh, superseded by those pieces of legislation. So a lot of times uh, we ended up being hamstrung by additional notice requirements um, that were much uh, longer than was necessary. Even though we do strive to provide as much as possible, there, were, uh, there has been some instances where we could have uh, ensured a more efficient and expedited process for um, uh, areas of municipal interest. So our next slide. So what has been changed? The notice provisions provided in the policy do not include anything that is prescribed, as just noted, in specific acts or legislation, statute, or bylaws. It's designed to remain up to date as an overarching statutes uh, continue to be regularly amended. So uh, we want to ensure that this stays um, uh, quite up to date and accurate for as long as possible before we need to review it again. 2003, it's been a long time, so it was definitely needed uh, by 2020. And it's modernized to reflect how citizens of calling would receive information. There's now greater emphasis on our website, email, and social uh, media channels. Next slide. So the policy recommendations include a number of notice uh, provisions for the following items. So that includes highways, changes to municipality, changes to council, changes to local boards and the BAA in particular, budget and finance, licensing and procedures. So again, with respect to procedures, we do have a number of bylaws that are in place that do provide for timeframes. Uh, for example, our procedural bylaw is very uh, prescriptive in um, the notice requirements for um, our various processes for public participation, uh, when notice has to be provided for our agendas. So if we're doing a significant change to the procedural bylaw, it requires public notice, but we do have additional notice features that are embedded within our various bylaws and policies already. Next slide. So these are examples of what um, the public notices look like. So the channels that we have, the town website, 
So there is actually on the main page of our website, on the left-hand column, there's a specific tab that says Notices and News. Uh, we have our e-newsletter, we have our social media accounts, and we have uh, the newspaper with our town page. So that is, we just wanted to provide a brief overview of the areas, but if there's any questions with regards to um, the manner of notice or the timeframes that we've proposed, we would be happy to address those. Thank you, Claire Gomez. And I believe we have to ask again for uh, whether there's public comment on this and uh, any of the attendees who are here uh, would like to ask a question or make a comment regarding what uh, Claire Gomez has presented just now. Certainly, so we have a, a number of attendees. And again, if you're interested in speaking to the notice policy, please either use the raise your hand feature or enter your question in the chat and we will unmute you. And there's no uh, interest to uh, comment on this uh, staff report at this time. And so I'll turn it to our council uh, or to our committee members. Does anybody uh, wish to speak to, uh, to this or have any uh, questions for Clerk Almas on the changes that are before us? Vice Chair Comey. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to Clerk Almas, just a question, please. So you touched on the role of the newspaper. And in the staff report, I know like locally, we have a printed paper and we have an online paper. And But we just put our notices in the printed paper. Is that correct? Do we use the online newspapers at all? Through, uh, through Chair McLeod to Councilor Comey. Uh, what our process is for the town page, because it is retained through an RFP process, we require that um, it, have to, it has to be a published paper and have an online presence as well. So our information is contained in their online versions as well. Okay, so it, uh, through, through you, Madam Chair. Okay, so it has to be both then, not just exclusively online. And that was something I didn't know that that's through a, through a RFP process, like a competitive sort of situation. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That's my question. Mayor Saunderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to Sarah. Sarah, thank you for the report. As I understand it, we were mandated uh, previously under the Municipal Act to have an actual bylaw and that's been amended so that now we just are required to have a policy. And so what we're doing is really streamlining, streamlining uh, to remove our bylaw and that uh, it, the policy is setting out how and when we would do our notice provisions. Uh, but there are still uh, specific pieces of legislation that do require and so the, the policy is basically deferring uh, to those uh, so that we are no longer in conflict uh, as we might've been with our bylaw. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was a great report. Councillor Berman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to the clerk, um, uh, sort of following up on what Councillor Comey's question was in the staff report under uh, definitions 1.6, it says newspaper means a local printed or online publication. So I assume that's uh, where she was going. When does the RFP process take place? Certainly uh, through Chamber Cloud to Councillor Berman. So we put that additional requirement in our RFP, but in an event where there might not be an option for both, um, we can foresee in the future. That's why we included in the definition an online or a paper uh, and didn't say and because uh, eventually there may not be a published hard copy of the newspaper and we wanna make sure that we're covered on both aspects. Okay, thanks. A great report and uh, you had me at already vetted by the town solicitor. Thank you, Councillor Berman. Any other questions from the committee? And so we'll call the question. Uh, 
And uh, we have moved by uh, Mayor Saunderson and seconded by Councillor Madigan, the staff report C2020-08 be received. And that council here in repeal public notice bylaw 03-12. And further that council here in approve the public notice policy as attached here too, as appendix A. And I will call the question. All those in favor. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. We move on now to item seven, which is uh, reports and minutes of other committees and boards. And- um, Chair, Chair McLeod. Yes, oh yes. Uh, CAO Skinner. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to say that um, uh, the clerk has been doing a great job in just uh, systematically moving through a great number, well, a good number of uh, bylaws and policies that haven't been updated for 20 or so years. So I think you'll see leading up to this and coming forward uh, a few things like this uh, uh, that will be renewed during this term of council that I think will be setting us all on good stead. So uh, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Chair and Clerk. <laughs> Thank you, and, and I'm sure everyone on this committee agrees with those sentiments. Uh, we move on to uh, number seven, which is uh, reports and minutes of other committees and boards. And um, uh, do we go through these? We go through these, or do we just read the uh, we read the whole motion and vote on them as a whole? Certainly through. Uh, I've forgotten how this works in yeah. six weeks. <laughs> yes, not a problem, Chair McLeod. Uh, we have them actually listed all together. So if you put the motion on the floor and if anybody has any specific questions, they can ask them before you call the vote. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and so uh, we have a uh, move by uh, Councillor Madigan and seconded by Councillor Berman that the minutes of the various committees and boards provided below be received and recommendations contained therein approved, which are the Accessibility Advisory Committee minutes from July the 16th of 2020, the Collingwood Downtown BIA Board of Management minutes from July the 9th of 2020, the special meeting of the Collingwood Downtown BIA Board of Management minutes from July the 20th of 2020, the Collingwood Downtown Town BIA Board of Management minutes from August the 13th of 2020, Museum and Advisory Committee minutes from July the 30th of 2020 and August 20th of 2020, and the Trails and Active Transportation Advisory Committee minutes of July 9th, 2020 and August 13th, 2020. And so before I call the vote, I'll ask if there are any comments on any of those, uh, of those reports or minutes that are before us and the recommendations contained therein. Vice Chair Comey. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. It's, uh, it's with respect to the latest set of minutes from the museum of August 20th, and it's item 8.2. And I thought it was of interest here that Supervisor Shaw advised that she's going to apply for some COVID-19 emergency support funding through the federal government. And uh, through you, Madam Chair, perhaps uh, Director Milanovic, if I could kindly ask if he could keep us apprised of that as the that application is submitted or moves along because I think it would be something interesting to the committee and the community. Director Milanovic. To you, you Chair, uh, to Vice Chair Comey, uh, <clears throat> I, will, I will keep you guys abreast of the situation as we move forward. Great, thank you so much. That's all, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Any other questions from members of the committee regarding any of these reports or minutes? Uh, I have one um, that I would like to uh, to ask the the clerk about regarding um, the BIA uh, minutes from uh, I believe from the twentieth of July and the thirteenth of August. And there's a change in the chairship uh, between those two minutes. And there is also I and I believe we're going to be dealing with this in the coming days. There appears to have been a resignation, and neither of those are addressed in the minutes. Either ex resignations accepted or chairships, the change of chairship acknowledged. Uh, ought that to be contained within those minutes, or has that not actually happened yet? Thank you, Chair McLeod. Um, and I appreciate you bringing this to my attention uh, prior to the meeting. And just for confirmation, it was not part of the meeting, so it didn't make the meeting minutes but it will be included on the next BIA board to accept uh, those resignations. Okay, thank you very much. And so I'll call the previous question then, uh, which, is the, which is the motion that is before us. Uh, all those in favor? And that passes unanimously. 
Thank you very much. And that brings us to item 7.5, which is the um, strategic multi-year accessibility plan. And uh, we have a final plan, uh, our final review of the final plan um, after the 30-day public consultation. And I believe we're welcoming uh, Margaret uh, Adolph into, uh, into the meeting to make a presentation on this topic. I'm hoping that we see her soon. There she is. Mm, now, Margaret, you're going to have to unmute yourself or someone can perhaps do it for you on this end. Okay, I've done, I've done it. Wonderful. I've got two marks for that, I hope. Extra, extra points every time. <laughs> Anyway, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair McLeod, uh, Mayor Saunderson, CAOs, uh, the councillors, I should say, and then CEO Skinner and Clerk uh, Sarah Olmus and anybody that's a guest here today. Um, I'm here today to update you on the multi-year accessibility plan. Uh, go back one plan. Just a minute, sorry. Um, I'm here uh, uh, today to update you on the multi-year accessible plan for 2020-2025 after public uh, feedback. I also want to thank Sarah Olmos and staff of the clerk's office for their help with the plan. Next slide, please. Uh, why do we need a plan? Under the Ontario Accessibility for Ontarians, uh, with Disability Act, all public sector organizations, as well as private and not-for-profit organizations with 50 or more employees must develop statements of commitment to accessibility and make them publicly available and create statements of commis uh, commitment to accessibility and develop a multi-year accessible plan and update them at least once every five years. Next, next slide, please. Well, here's the background. Um, the uh, draft plan was presented by the Accessibility Advisory Committee in July. You probably remember. Sorry about that. It's accounting season. Um, uh, standing uh, uh, committee uh, recommend we proceed with the public consultation for 30 days period. Um, a communication strategy was developed that included uh, Engage Collingwood, including background information, draft plan, survey, and a, and a story feature. Notice in the town page for three weeks, numerous social media posts for four weeks, direct communication to 18 agencies and organizations with direct interest in accessibility initiatives. Next, please. Next slide, please. So public engagement, would you believe we had 180 visitors to our engage page, 52 people viewed the draft plan, seven stories received, the stories featured allow individuals to share challenges or successes with accessibility in the community to help guide further changes to our plan. Somebody wants to get hold of me, sorry about that. Uh, four responses said the plan was great and they could not recommend any further changes. Four responses included great ideas to enhance the plan that we will review. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, let you, uh, one of the questions, do you think the draft identifies appropriate goals, commitments, and action item for the next five years? We had four people say, yes, it's great. Another question was asked, do you have any recommendations or improvements that should be considered to ensure an accessible Collingwood? And the, the message we got back, nope. Collingwood's facilities, services, and programs are great. So we're getting good feedback. Next uh, slide, please. Changes to the final draft. We've made some changes to the final draft because we got some feedback. Um, 
some of you guys said they'd want to offer more inclusive programs, support for caregivers, environmental uh, for programs in smaller settings, low noise, low lighting, et cetera. This was for the commitment, accessibility, accessible customer service. So what we've changed here, we've added the following proposed action. Work with various departments that provide programs to explore and identify more inclusive and diversified programming opportunities. Uh, one of the things that we're doing right now is at our next meeting, uh, Accessible Advisory Committee meeting, we have on the agenda to address accessible uh, barriers effective to individuals with cognitive disabilities. This is uh, this has been brought up to us that sometimes uh, we need to address people uh, that have some cognitive uh, disabilities. Next slide, please. The changes to the final draft, uh, again, uh, the feedback to commitment two, we had accessible website features, large print for signage, the CNIB approved, uh, communications are in clear, easy to understand language. So what we've done is we revised the wording for the proposed action. And you'll see it on the slide here, continue to monitor. And we've added and train staff on accessible communication content and design. And I believe this change makes the commitment more clear. Okay, next slide. There was no changes uh, to commitment three, accessible employment in workplaces. So we're gonna go on to commitment four and the feedback we got is better accessibility on trails and sidewalks, more curb cuts, better snow removal on sidewalks and parking spaces. And you know, in the last few years, we've done amazing jobs of doing curb cuts. Uh, I mean, we don't have to go back um, many years and we saw people struggling with wheelchairs and the curbs. But uh, so we made some uh, changes. So we changed the commitment for to read accessible transportation services and systems. And the transportation standard under the integrated accessibility standard regulation sets out the requirements to prevent and remove barriers to public transportation sidewalks and trails. We got it back, sidewalks and trails, so that everyone can easily travel in Collingwood. And we've added a new action item here, work with the public works and engineering department to understand opportunities and challenges with respect to winter and regular maintenance to determine how best to create a safe and accessible environment for all individuals, including those with mobility challenges. So uh, as we talk about, we see more scooters, more um, wheelchairs, uh, and this is to help these people. Next slide, please. So we got uh, commitment five. Um, uh, we uh, several comments about ensuring parks and playgrounds are accessible have safety features and have universal design access. We've got a number of people talking about children um, and playgrounds, children with disabilities. We don't think of that often, but that does happen. Uh, so when commitment five, enhancing accessibility of public spaces, we've made uh, some changes. And uh, when constructing or renovating municipal facilities, and we've uh, now added including parks and playgrounds. Ensure features such as elevators, doors, washrooms, parking, furnishings, and equipment. That's interesting. We never think of equipment for people. Will be fully accessible or appropriate accommodations available that preserves individuals' dignity and independence. We want everybody to feel that they're welcome and uh, they can use everything. Next slide, please. Uh, there was no changes to commitment six, uh, accessible procurement. Uh, we, uh, we're trying to ensure that the products or services are more accessible and meet the needs required. And I think the town of Collingwood does an excellent job with that. 
Uh, there was some concern about accessible residential housing options, including design and affordability. So we've made a change to commitment seven, determine the best solution regarding accessibility advice and guidance in the site development process, including opportunities to encourage accessible, affordable residential design. Okay, that's a, a big uh, one. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Maybe. Okay. I got it. I got it. We got it. We got it. Okay. Um, feedback already incorporated in the plan. We've also received a number of comments regarding elements already incorporated into the plan that confirm they are valuable action items for the next five years. Accessible and equitable employment opportunities. I think we all strive for that. Accessible building design, including lower counters, accessible doors and ramps. We're trying our best. Uh, we've made great strides um, in doors and ramps and uh, hopefully we can, some people are complaining about the buttons are too far away, but we'll look at those. Accessible businesses, even though the town cannot mandate Accessible features outside of the requirements of the building code and the AODA, the committee has identified an opportunity to work with the business community in an advocacy role to encourage more accessible or universal designs features as well as to communicate business responsibilities to comply with the AOD Act requirement by 2025. As you, as you know, uh, the Act actually started in 2005 and it came into uh, effect of 2010 and so everybody had 15 years but they changed a few of the things with the older buildings because they realized that they couldn't mandate a lot of the older buildings and buildings built in the 1800 1850 like some of our buildings are 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 difficult to, to change consideration of the american sign language for staff and potential public programming opportunities this is another thing we've taken, the committee's taken. And in fact, it's another, another item on the Accessibility Advisory Committee for the agenda this month. So we're looking at the, uh, the sign language. So with all that, I wanna thank you. Special thank you to all the organizations and members of the public and committee members and staff for providing their valuable input. I was just amazed at the number of people who came forward uh, and uh, the number of people who came forward and says you're doing a great job. So let's let's uh, let's take it and uh, thank those people also. And thank you for having me today. And thank you, Ms. Adolf. Um, and I will turn to the committee and ask if there are co any comments or uh, questions uh, regarding this presentation. Committee. All right, and then the motion in front of us is uh, moved by Councillor Berman and seconded by Mayor Saunderson that the 2020 to 2025 strategic multi-year accessibility plan hereby be adopted. And I will call the question, all those in favor? And that passes unanimously, thank you very much. We move on to departmental updates and discussion, and I believe we have several, uh, and we will begin with uh, item 8.1 which is the service delivery review update. And I will uh, hand it over to Acting CIO Skinner. Thank you very much, Chair McLeod. And in recognition of the uh, wonderful work being done in the Executive Director of Culver's area, I'm going to immediately hand it over to him to uh, update the committee. Thank you. Excuse me, I was choking a second ago for you, Chair. Um, the, uh, the service delivery review. So um, an RFP was sent out and, uh, and it was based on the idea that we're looking to improve the understanding of programs and services that are delivered by the town um, and provide information that will allow the community council and staff to make informed strategic choices regarding those services. So the things that we'll be considering in this project um, will be things like information on the users who are benefiting from services, 
um, any opportunities we might be able to find to streamline services, um, not indicating and identifying uh, success and performance measures and how achievement can be done while increasing efficiency and effectiveness. We're looking at cost savings. Um, we're looking at uh, where the town can better identify uh, or better focus, I should say, on core businesses. Uh, vision of where the physical locations for the services should be and what's offering through there now and, and what should be available online. We're looking at possible opportunities to leverage, leverage or collaborate with other municipalities um, or where other studies might be, might be warranted. And we're looking for prioritized recommendations. So effectively the, the SDR will assist the town in exploring how municipal services will be delivered sustainably over the long term and also take a comprehensive look at why and what the town does and, uh, and if it can be done more effectively or efficiently. Um, this is being funded by a provincial grant of over $180,000. Um, so this is actually allowing us to do what, uh, what had been discussed with council being done over a longer period of time. Um, you'll recall the deep dive uh, process of last year. Uh, this will mean that uh, nobody else has to go through what I went through in delivering that deep dive. Um, and, uh, but you'll also recall too that uh, it took quite a while for us to assemble that deep dive. When you're in the process of delivering services, it's very hard sometimes to analyze services. And so um, this gives us that opportunity. And so we're very grateful for, uh, for the grant. Um, the RFP has closed now. Uh, the bids have been evaluated and Deloitte Consulting uh, is the successful proponent to implement the review. Um, the, uh, we were looking forward to a first meeting with them and that'll help us to determine uh, a, a timeline. There's a few pieces here. Uh, COVID has put a delay on this project um, and the province has already um, stretched the, uh, the end date once. Uh, we're gonna, after we have a conversation with Deloitte, uh, we may be back uh, with the province to ask about extending the deadline again um, for completion. Um, ideally, we'd be looking at an early next year completion, uh, but after we have all those conversations, we'll have a much better sense of, of the total time frame. And that's the update. Thank you very much. And uh, see you, Skinner. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, thank you very much, Chair. I just wanted to um, add that uh, I think this is uh, another piece of getting our house in order. And, and uh, one of the primary functions, in my opinion, that Council has is to manage these services to the public, because that's really what we're doing with the tax funding that is, is collected on behalf of uh, residents and property owners here. And so the work that Dean's doing with uh, Ingrid Masiak and the others, uh, Deloitte, now that they've been named as a successful proponent, I think will is really moving toward helping council members to uh, to understand how many users there are for the different services that are that are offered. You know how much of our of our tax funding goes toward each, and uh, it's it's never perfect. Like we'll never get it down to the dollar, whether that dollar was you know keeping the door open for the library or for the people who were going through that entrance space to go upstairs to go to planning or something like that. But I think we'll give you a lot more information to make educated decisions for our community moving forward. And I'm really pleased with the hundred eighty thousand dollars from the from the province for this work. Thank you. Members of the committee, have you any questions uh, for either uh, uh, Dean or Sonia? Mayor Saunderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to either Dean or Sonia. Um, uh, one of the points you raised, uh, Dean, was the uh, performance metrics and looking at the efficiencies of our services we, as we provide them to our end users and who they might be. And uh, so benchmarking and setting up those performance metrics is uh, a key uh, to this process, I would think. And we were just involved in the UN Habitat Conference when we were talking about establishing uh, benchmarks and performance uh, metrics for, for municipalities generally. And while these are internal, I'm wondering if there's a way that we can link these uh, to our external uh, or some sort of external uh, benchmarking to kind of give us an idea of and not only how our services are being delivered internally, but what the efficiencies are and uh, in terms of our role as a municipality uh, and being sustainable moving forward. I don't know if it's possible to connect the two, but it seems to me that 
we're kind of looking at a mirror image, uh, image of the same coin about metric, uh, the metrics and performance indicators, one internally and one more externally in terms of our role as a municipality in the lives of our residents. And I'm wondering if there's a way to link the two. Executive Director Culver. Yeah, I, off the top of my head, I, I, I thank you, Chair, that I think it's, um, I think it's a question we, we need to ask the consultant and we need to get some advice on, on how relevant that'll be. And I don't, and I don't, I'm not trying to avoid it. I'm just sort of, it's, it's a very difficult, um, we, we run into this often when we talk about sort of uh, municipal measures, the, uh, the MM, I can't remember where they are. When you're comparing communities, you're comparing processes because it, oftentimes we're uh, faced with an apples and oranges comparator at the base, which means that everything beyond that is, uh, is difficult to compare. Um, I, again, I, I would defer to a consultant who has a lot of expertise in this area and, and potentially there is a, a, a method or a modality for doing that. I just, don't, I just don't know exactly what that is at this time. Definitely, I think we'll, based on your question, we'll ask the question. Thank you, I appreciate that. Does that assist, anything else? Nope, that's it for me, thank you. And the other members of the, of the committee have questions for either of these? Okay, and uh, neither have I. So we will move on uh, to uh, item 8.2, uh, the budget software and uh, Treasurer Leonard. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, since this will be Mr. Switzer's first budget, I'm going to turn that question and update over to him. Oh, welcome. Thank you, uh, Treasurer Leonard, and uh, thank you, Chair McLeod. Um, as the committee is aware, the town uh, was, uh, had issued an RFP for uh, budget software, and we've completed an open market RFP process for the budgeting software solution. And the successful proposal was Questica. Uh, we're currently finalizing the contract agreement with Questica, and subsequent to that, uh, implementation will begin at a date to be determined. Given the time frame, uh, the tight time frame for the 2021 budget, uh, as well as a 13 week implementation timeline for the Questica budget solution. Uh, we've decided that Questica will not be utilized for the 2021 budget preparation. Uh, we plan on beginning, <clears throat> excuse me, the implementation at a date that allows uh, for us to dedicate sufficient resources to the implementation to ensure we, we implement it properly. Uh, and then we will, we plan on utilizing the software in 2021 for budget to actual comparison uh, as well as uh, you know the 2022 budget preparation. And uh, that's the update for uh, the budget software. Thank you. Thank you, Treasurer Switzer. Can I say both? Are they both treasurer at the same time? Uh, any questions from this committee uh, for, uh, for the treasurers? Uh, I actually have one, and um, and and Mr. Spitzer, I, I wonder whether when we say it's going to take an implementation, and that once it's implemented for 2021, we're going to have a better look at at budget versus actual. Can you sort of explain to me why that is an important thing? I think I understand why, but I think that it's it's something that that not all of us really grasp deep in our soul. Well, I think what what I'm speaking to is more. Um, easier access to budget to actual comparisons for staff and council. Uh, I don't want to speak before, you know, having completed the implementation and working with the implementation team on the exact functionality and the features that that will provide. But as part of the part of the proposal that we received, uh, there was some very, and the demo that we saw, there were some very interesting features that allowed for very um, detailed explanations on variances and, and allowing more efficient um, communication of those variances by uh, the individuals and the managers and department heads who are responsible for those budget lines. So we'll, we would be able to know sooner rather than later when there's been something go on that we might need to be apprised of is what I'm asking really. Um, Once this I, is in place. Sorry, I, I can't because we'll be comparing budget to actual. The the question, the answer to your question, really relates to on how quickly we can get uh, updated figures into our GL that then will communicate with this budget software. So that's more related to how efficiently we are recording invoices, and, and I think that's a, a separate conversation 
uh, to be had that, that isn't necessarily related directly to the budget software. Got it. CEO Skinner. Thank you, Chair McLeod. And in response to your question as well, um, in talking with the, the two treasurers, um, one of the things that I think uh, the software will help us with is not only looking at what's already been spent, but looking at how department heads see the year shaping up to the end of year. So, you know, billings that are, you know, may not have come in yet, but they know are will be late or will be early or there will be unexpected costs and potholes or whatever the thing is. We'll be able to harvest more of the, uh, the intellect and knowledge uh, within the corporation, not only on the financial side, but I hope in the leadership of the departments and, and their relationship uh, back to finances reports. Thank you. Thank you, that, uh, that does answer my question. Uh, thank you. Uh, there being no other questions from the committee, uh, we'll move on to item 8.3, uh, which is uh, Fire Chief Parr. And uh, I will let him float your boat. That was for the mayor. <laughs> thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I think there's a couple pictures that could go along with this, or I did supply them. First of all, um, I'm, I'm, I don't know if more excited, proud, or, or I, I'm not sure what I uh, want to, how to describe it, that we uh, received the boat last week from um, our builder in uh, Perry Sound. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to be the first one to step on it and also drive it. So that was uh, a pleasure for myself, uh, bringing back memories when I was on the um, trucks and doing stuff like this uh, in my past life. Um, the, the guys, the staff are just super, super excited about it. Um, the, um, design of it, uh, how we've got it so far, the process we're in right now is just getting it decaled lettered, uh, to meet, uh, industry standards with registration on it. And then, uh, proceeding with, uh, training the staff. It's a, it's a whole new boat for us compared to what we shared with parks, rec and culture. So it's going to take a little time, but still, if we need it, we can put it in the service. And the advantage to this boat to the other, we have actually a built-in fire pump uh, came with this boat. So it's, it's, it's pretty exciting and it's, it's just fabulous how it handles in the big water and also in around the shallows in the marina. The other thing I'd, I'd like to say is also still can't believe a, a resident uh, stood up and donated money for this. So it was uh, pretty good that that happened. So. Um, if any questions on the boat, I have one other little tiny update also. So, Members of the committee, have you questions for uh, Fire Chief Farr regarding the boat? Vice Chair Comey. Thank you so uh, much, uh, Madam Chair. Through you to the Chief, well, obviously, congratulations. That's, a, that's really exciting. And then I think you had mentioned before in an email that it has a certain uh, rescue capabilities for paddlers as well to bring, you know, recreational boats on if needed. Is that correct? Um, through you, your chair, that's correct, uh, Councillor. Uh, the front nose, it's called a bull nose design where the front nose drops and it goes level with the water. So it's uh, available to uh, pull vessels, small vessels, uh, people and other devices onto the boat easy uh, for rescue purposes, so. That's, that's great news. That's really wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Mayor Saunderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, this is a Stanley boat. And uh, just as a point of interest, uh, Mr. Stanley's daughter has uh, represented Canada many times at the Outrigger Canoe Championships, and I think is a world gold medalist. So if she ever needed rec uh, rescuing, uh, I'm sure this boat would be up to it. But uh, it's very exciting to have this boat and uh, thank you very much to the private donor that helped to make this happen. And uh, I have a question uh, now that we've exhausted the questions from the committee. Uh, is there going to be a name for this uh, vessel? Um, we have not discussed that yet. Um, that could be something we could do maybe a little competition or, or something within town that would be, you must have a name you want. No, um, no. I highly recommend against a competition. I think that the British Navy can speak to that um, <laughs> because of their Bodie McBoatface that they, so I would recommend against that. 
perhaps okay. stay. <laughs> I was just cu curious to know when you said you were going to be putting decals and stuff on it, whether there was a, whether it was the, you know, the HMCS calling wood or something. Uh, no, through you, Chair, not at this time. We, it just will, um, we're, we're just, uh, Marine One is the official designation of the boat. And then that's what we uh, um, will be dispatched with by Barry Fire. So. Super, thank you. And uh, you have another update that you want to provide with us with. Yeah, just a, um, uh, in 2019 budget, we uh, were approved for a fire, a new fire truck. Um, excited to say that the cab's been manufactured with no delay through COVID and arrived in New Brunswick where the manufacturer that does the rest of the work will be working on it and looks like a January uh, delivery. So um, everything's on, on uh, par for that, P pardon my pun. Uh, so it's uh, actually, uh, <laughs> well, it, it seems like tonight everybody else got a little in. So that was my first, um, that uh, it's another exciting piece of apparatus that will lead us to the future in the fire service in Collingwood. So. Thank you so much, Chief Barr. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, we'll move on to item 8.4, which is uh, Acting Director Milanovic uh, regarding Fisher Field and the project that uh, has been underway low these many months. Good evening, Madam, Good evening, Madam Chair. Uh, this is gonna be probably the shortest update possible. <laughs> uh, the tender package for the said uh, washroom at Fisher Field and change rooms has uh, been scaled down to from the original version uh, or the original concept. Concept. The, the tender was posted today on the bingo uh, <clears throat> and the scaled down version includes four gender neutral washrooms, two team change rooms and one designated referee change room. And it should close in about 30 days. Thank you. Any questions from uh, any members of the committee for Acting Director Milanovic? Vice Chair Comey. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to Director Longovich and Executive Director Culver. Congratulations. That was a long time coming. You got lots of feedback from our community. And uh, while it was certainly uh, unfortunate that the ultimate plan uh, didn't receive the funding necessary, I am certain our community is going to be absolutely delighted by the outcome. So congratulations to all parties involved in getting this uh, package out. It's really, really uh, going to be a good news story for the community as a whole. With over 1,000 registered players and 30 years in Collingwood of our local soccer club and many tournaments that bring literally thousands of families into the community, it will be much celebrated. So thank you again. Any other questions from the committee? All right, thank you very much, uh, Acting Director Milanovic. And then that moves us on to um, item number nine on our agenda, which is public delegations. And that is an opportunity for anyone who feels, they, uh, feels the need to, um, to address this committee uh, with a time limit of about five minutes each. And have we anybody, uh, Clerk Almas, I turn to you, uh, anyone who is interested in, um, in speaking to us. I'm trying to stall while they get their hand up. Is, an old radio trick. Certainly. So the attendees uh, have been on through the meeting, so they know the process, and, and no one has requested to speak. And that brings us to item number 10, which is other business. Have we uh, any, any other business members of the committee? Speak now. And item 11, adjournment. And on my uh, motion summary, I have moved by Councillor Comey uh, that the Corporate and Community Services Standing Committee be hereby adjourned. And may I have a vote on that question, please? All in favor? We stand adjourned. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Chair.